Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. Early in my career, I worked with a CAD training company, and I was basically for a while, I was their entire marketing department. And, and what this is, is it's computer-aided design. And so these were people that would train other companies how to use these CAD systems. And if, if you're not familiar with what a, what a CAD system or CAD software is, is basically everything that you own these days that's manufactured is created in a piece of software in three dimensions. So the car that you drive, most likely the entire car was designed in a CAD system, in, in a computer. And I'm talking about everything, where they have the whole thing designed virtually before, uh, before they make a single part. And so all the different little parts inside your car were designed in a CAD system so they'd all fit together perfectly and work together. And, and it's more than just even putting the whole item together, they're able to do stress testing on metals and, and aerodynamics, all of this stuff in these CAD systems. It's absolutely incredible what they can do with it. And they'll design these parts and you can just look at it virtually and take it apart and, and figure out. I mean, and it was amazing. So I was introduced to this whole world that I honestly barely even knew existed. Now I was, I was doing 3D work uh, from an art standpoint, and there's a lot of different types of software that do it so you can make photorealistic imagery. But this is a, this was a totally different thing where these these were engineers that were ma that were masters at the software that was used to create things. And then what this company that I worked with did is they would work with all these different these different organizations that were manufacturing things or creating things and teach them how to use the software more effectively. So it, it, probably every piece of software that you ever use, there's hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of features in it that you don't even aren't aware of because there's just so many things and, and you've never read the book cover to cover. So this company would go to all these big, massive companies and train their designers how to use the software better. That's basically what they did. And so then I became aware of all these different companies that were utilizing this CAD software, things that you just never think about. And so some of their clients were people like Apple Computers and General Motors and NASA. And, and one of the ones that surprised me the most that I didn't really appreciate at the time was General Electric. General Electric, you think of them, for example, this last weekend, I was buying some light bulbs. And of course, you go to the light bulb aisle and you see the little GE logo. And of course, of course, General Electric makes light bulbs. But the things you don't necessarily realize is that General Electric also makes jet engines. And they also make diesel locomotive engines. And, and General Electric does so much so much more than just things th than making things like light bulbs and of course we tie light bulbs to general electric because this goes all the way back to thomas edison who really was when general electric general electric was created it was based on a lot of i mean a, a conglomeration of some of edison's companies so but again they do so much more than you would realize and one of the things that that General Electric is responsible for in kind of a a really unusual way is non-reflective glass. And I, I want to tell you about this because you're going to find this story so fascinating. But non-reflective glass impacts everybody's life all the time. And you don't even realize it. But I mean, whenever you see a, a every movie you watch, the lenses that it's shot through are used through a special type of glass with certain types of coatings that prevent it from, from being reflective. It makes it non-reflective. If you wear glasses, there's a really good chance that you got non-reflective lenses. And the beauty of, of non-reflective glass, it, it, well, I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple. When, when light is coming toward glass, a certain amount of it goes through the glass 
But the fact that you can see something reflected off of it tells you that not everything's making it through. I, 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 that just by virtue of the fact you can see things being reflected back. The light that's being reflected back to you didn't make it through the lens. And so what happens is when, when light hits the front of the lens, it reflects back some of it. When it gets to the back of the lens, some of it's reflected back too. And then also, if you wear glasses, for example, you'll get ghosting images because, interestingly enough, your eyes will get reflected back to you if you don't have non-reflective coating on the glass. So you'll actually get ghost images literally looking at the reflections from, your, from things being reflected from your eyeballs. And light coming in from the sides is being reflected back into your eyes. So, so when, you, when you don't get the non-reflective coating, is that the right way to say it? You have options when you get glasses of getting non-reflective glass. And if you don't do that, you're actually not getting the best visuals you could because there's literally stuff being reflected off that's not making it through. And you're also getting distracted by other things being reflected back towards your eyes. So when they put non-reflective coating on, on glasses specifically, they do it on both sides. They, they do some on the front and on the back. And this gets you just a much better better image if you were in glasses and and similarly with lenses the the lens on your fo- your uh, phone on your uh, your camera on your phone uh, so many things that, when you start talking about photography and, and videography all of this stuff that impacts you because even if you're not doing it yourself you're watching it you're watching things that have been shot through these things and all of this stuff the reason it is so high quality <laughs> is partly because of non-reflective glass. Now, where did it come from? And this is this is this story is so amazing because it starts with <laughs> it starts back at the beginning of General Electric. So, so General Electric, Thomas Edison had these companies that that became Edison General Electric in in 18 in 1889. And then in 1892, there were several companies that were put together that became General Electric. And then it was in 1890, uh, in 1896, the original Dow Jones Industrial Average, there were 12 companies involved with it. General Electric was one of them. So, So we're going all the way back to 1896 here. When, as we're talking about General Electric now, there was a person working at General Electric, and they were working here during this time when General Electric became part of the original Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I mean, this was this really, really big deal conglomerate group of companies that had been, for all intents and purposes, had come as a result of Thomas Edison. Okay. Well, there was a man working there named George Blodgett, and this would have been in the 1890s. Well, on December 3rd of 1897, George Blodgett, who was a patent attorney at General Electric, was murdered in his home. And weirdly enough, this experience this this murder leads to <laughs> the development of non-reflective glass and i want to tell you tell you how it's so it's so interesting how all these pieces came together but i want to read to you a couple of these newspaper articles of when this happened so in in uh, march so so he was murdered in his home on december 3rd of 1897 so now here's a newspaper article that was published on march 28th of 1898 and it's called the Blodgett case, and it's where they think they found the guy that that murdered him. So this year, so March uh, again, March twenty eighth of eighteen ninety eight. This is published. This is I'm, I've taken from a, a newspaper in Waterbury, Connecticut. The Blodgett case, murder of Schenectady lawyer may be caught. So by the way. This George Blodgett is working in Schenectady, and that is where General Electric began. Schenectady, New York. Okay, that was the that was the the first uh, 
manufacturing I, I, I don't know the best way to put this but this is where this is where general electric really began the blodgett case murder of schenectady lawyer may be caught what detective doherty thinks is uh, uh, it thinks is of the opinion that buck davis arrested on an old charge knows a great deal about the cold-blooded slang schenectady new york march 28th detective george s doherty who has been working on the murder of George R. Blodgett ever since it occurred in this city on December 3rd, believes that at last he has found the key to the mystery. Mr. Blodgett, who was the patent attorney for General Electric Company, was shot by a burglar while he was defending his property and died two days later. A reward of $5,000 offered by the General Electric Company brought a score of detectives to the city. They all worked in vain, however, for there apparently was not the slightest clue. All gave up the task except Doherty. And he believes now that when he had William alias Buck Davis arrested in Troy Saturday, he landed a participant in the crime. Davis is a notorious crook and burglar. And it is known that he was in Schenectady the day before the murder was committed. He was arrested on a bench warrant charging burglary, burglary and larceny on May 14, 1891. The warrant was dated March 8, 1898, and it was signed by District Attorney White of Washington County. The crime was the blowing up of a safe at Greenwich. The real reason for his arrest, however, was that the evidence against him in the Blodgett murder had become so strong that Doherty thought he would put him in a place where he could get his hands on him when he wanted him. And there was no indictment against Davis in Schenectady County. It was decided to arrest him on the Washington County charge. Doherty returned to Schenectady Saturday night, but refuses to divulge what evidence he has against Davis, except that he is confident Davis is the man. Okay. So George, George Blodgett murdered in his home. They find this guy that they think uh, murdered him uh, and they they arrest him on a different charge so that they can have him so that they can be watching him and and have him as they're gathering this other as evidence all right now <laughs> now this is in may 28th this is two months later now i i need to warn you uh we're going to be talking i'm going to be sharing something in this little article here that where it refers to a suicide so I don't want, if you're, if you don't like hearing about things like that, this article is going to be talking about a suicide here. And it's, it, it, it's so interesting when you, when you hear all how these things kind of connect. So, uh, so anyway, I just wanted to give you the warning. On May 28th, this is an article from a Washington DC newspaper, Buck Davis, a suicide. Noted criminal strangles himself in his cell. Troy, New York, May 27th. Buck Davis, the notorious burglar who recently escaped from Washington County Jail and was recaptured in West Virginia, was found dead in his cell yesterday at Salem, having committed suicide. Davis uh, was tried on Wednesday before Judge Little on a charge of jailbreaking and on pleading guilty was sentenced to five years in Danamora Prison and to pay a fine of $1,000. He left the court smilingly and was placed in a heavy steel cell. His guards went to the cell to call on him for breakfast when his body was found on the floor. Davis had taken the mattress and after tearing it into strips, formed a rope. This he tied to the bedpost which the other, uh, with the other end around his neck and throwing himself on the floor, slowly strangled to death. Davis was charged with the murder of lawyer Blodgett in Schenectady several months ago, and detectives have been engaged in securing evidence to convict him of that charge. He was also accused of extorting money from an aged couple near Schenectady by burning their feet on a stove, and on the expiration of his recent sentence was to have been tried on those charges. Several years ago, uh, Chief Detective Markham of Troy had a desperate encounter with Davis in which the latter tried to kill the chief. All right. So now they found the person they think is the murderer of George Blodgett. He, they put him in jail and then he commits suicide. So they're unable to ever really find out. 
So now the George Blodgett case, this person who's a patent attorney at General Electric, this case is now kind of unsolved. They think they solved it, but they aren't ever going to know. Well, the thing I didn't tell you is that George Blodgett, who had been murdered on December 3rd of 1897, he and his wife were expecting a child. And it was this child was almost ready, was almost uh, due. The child was due basically the next month. So he dies. Uh, he's murdered in his home. And 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 the following month, from a, this burglary that he tries to thwart, the following month, his wife then has this baby. And. The baby is born on January 10th of, of 1898. So it's basically just barely over a month after this man, George Blodgett, is murdered, this patent attorney for General Electric. So in 1901, just a couple of years later, the mother of this baby now, that's just a couple of years old, decides she wants to get out of the country. And she wants to raise her children now you know her husband her husband who was uh who was murdered apparently had left enough money behind and had left everything in such a way that that now his his widow and the children will be able to have basically they've, they've been taken care of and so mom now takes these children including this baby that was born a month after this person was murdered after the dad was murdered and she moves to France and she moves to France because she wants her children to be bilingual. She wants them to grow up and have these other experiences. And so they grow up in France and they travel through Europe. And, and as it turns out, this child that I told you about that was born, Catherine, Catherine Burr Blodgett is her full name is apparently really super intelligent and they learn this early on and she's brilliant at mathematics she's brilliant at physics and chemistry and so she ends up graduating from high school even early i think so she, it would she was about 15 years old when she graduated from high school so they move back to the united states and in uh, she ends up going to the university of chicago where she graduates in 1917 with a degree in in physics and chemistry and she she gets her master's degree in 1917 in 1917 so so when i say she graduates she gets a master's degree in 1917 at the university of chicago and her thesis on the, is on the absorption of gases by carbon which is basically the principle that they use gas masks for so now, so here, so here we go. So she graduates from the University of Chicago and she has this degree in physics and the person who basically is now a patent attorney at, at General Electric. So keep this straight. Her father, Catherine's father had been a patent attorney at General Electric well, now here we are 20 years later after the murder, one of the people who's now working as a patent attorney who would have been in that same position that her father was, his name is Albert Davis. And Albert Davis uh, knows or meets or somehow comes in contact with now Catherine Blodgett, the daughter of the previous patent attorney <laughs> for General Electric. And he sponsors her to come now work a a as a researcher in General Electric because she's this super brilliant chemist, physicist who has a master's degree now in, in physics and then sponsors her now to come do research in General Electric, the very company that her father had been working for 20 years earlier. And of course, she has an interest in being there because she lives in Schenectady. And that's where her that's where her family's from. That's where her father had been working for General Electric. 
All right. So now she's she when she arrives there, she finds out that there is this there's a guy that's been working there named Dr. Irving Langmuir. And he has done this. He's done this research on how to create a, a film on water of single molecules. This whole brand new thing where he was able to make a single layer of molecules on water. And he's done this incredible research on this. And then he's kind of pigeonholed it. They didn't know where to go with it or what to do with it. So he kind of sets it aside. So now Catherine Blodgett comes in and begins working as a research assistant at, uh, at General Electric. Underneath the guy who has now done this this research and has cre- figured out how to do these single la- layer molecules on water. But he's not doing anything with that. He just had kind of set that aside. And so now she's working with this guy and they're doing all these different things, research for different ways of <laughs> using, creating light bulbs and, and all this different. Anyway, she's this super important researcher there at General Electric. And as a matter of fact, she's so successful there that her, this guy Langmuir actually works it out so that she can go to Cambridge in England for a couple of years while she's working at General Electric to get her doctorate. And then in, in 1926, she gets a, she gets a doctorate at Cambridge University and then comes back to work at General Electric, okay, where her father had been working before he was murdered. So in 1934, she's still working with this Lang, Dr. Langmuir. And she says, she talks to him and she says, all this research that you had done on the single layer of molecules, I would like to build on that. I'd like to continue some of the research that he had abandoned or kind of left almost at this point, almost 20 years earlier. So she's back. She has her doctorate. She's been working there for several years. She's, she's at General Electric. And, and she tells this guy that she's been working with, I want to pick up on that, on that research. Okay. So now this research that she does ends up becoming a really, really big deal. And I just want to read, there's this, there's this really long article, and I kind of want to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read a couple of points from this that, that are so much fun. So this is an art newspaper article now that's written in March of uh, 5th of 1939. And this is an article about Catherine Burr Blodgett. Okay. Now this is written by, I don't know who the guy is that wrote this, but he's talking about Catherine Blodgett. And when you hear this, this is so great. This again, this is the author writing an article about her while she's doing in, in, in her research. You can tell a scientist by his or her unquenchable hunger for final truth. And there is no such thing as final truth. You discover one truth only to find another unsolved question just beyond it, still out of human reach. That is what makes the pursuit of science so fascinating. You never stay in one room. You're always venturing farther and farther into larger and larger rooms. While I watched Dr. Blodgett, now again, this is the author of this article talking about Catherine Blodgett. While I watched Dr. Blodgett replete, repeatedly dipping a glass slide into the film of barium, barium stearate floating on the water. So in other words, again, she's picked up on this research that this man had done 20 years earlier. And she's now at General Electric working on this, continuing this research. And she's taking it further and further and further. So, floating on the water. When it had taken on a coating 44 layers deep, she handed it to me and told me to look through it. It was clear, far beyond a similar clean piece of glass. I looked at a glass glass framed picture on the wall. There should have been a glare of sunlight on the picture, but looking at the picture through the film coated glass, there was no glare. It was just as doc- uh, let's see, the annoying glare 
had been tricked into those magical angled corridors built up by Dr. Blodgett with the invisible film and had been hopelessly lost in their intricate invisible mazes. And then they've called such glass invisible glass, said Dr. Blodgett, smiling, but that's not the right word for it. Better call it non-reflecting glass. What it does is to prevent the reflection of light. What Dr. Catherine Blodgett had done was she had invented, for all intents and purposes, the process of creating non-reflective glass. She had done it by picking up on research that had been done 20 years earlier in General Electric by another scientist that she was working with. General Electric, where she had gotten the job because a person, because her father had worked there, and a little just under two decades later, or about two decades later, the person who was now working in the position that her father was in when her father was murdered, invited her to come to General Electric and work as a research assistant, where then she picked up on some research that had been started before she got there, and she pushed it all the way through to a position where she had actually invented what would what we would know today as non-reflective glass. They were able to use this technology that she created, apparently, in filming Gone with the Wind. And the reason that it has that extra little bit of clarity that everybody talks about is because she was able, they were able to use some of this technology that she had developed for non-reflective glass. And then, in World War II, one of the things that they that the pr- people with periscopes in submarines, one of the problems they would have is as this re- light would go or the glass would go up above water, it would reflect and people would see it. And it made it easier to notice where submarines were because of this highly reflective light or highly f- reflective glass that was used in the periscopes. So this technology that she developed, they were able to use on periscope lens. Uh, periscope lenses to make it non-reflective so that you couldn't see it. And again, this non-reflective glass is used in your everyday life. Every day of your life, you are impacted by the existence of non-reflective glass, which came from this woman, Catherine Burr Blodgett, who was the daughter, uh, as she worked at General Electric doing research Again, as the daughter of a man who was a General Electric employee as a patent attorney. And I love this connection so much. Because here's this man who's a patent attorney for General Electric. He's murdered. His daughter, many years later, begins working at General Electric. And is becomes a person who actually creates the things that become the patents, the kind of things that her father would have worked to protect. And now she's the one working at that same company years later. And why was she back at that company? Well, largely because her father had been there. And now she's there carrying on and doing the things that her father would have been working to protect. It's it's such a great, great story. And then today, all of us benefit from the research that this woman had done because she was at General Electric because her father had worked there. It's such such a great story. And you know, part of, one of the reasons I love this so much is because I, 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 as you can tell whenever, if you ever listen to this story, this, this show, I'm constantly looking back into old, into history and the stories that got us where we are today. And one of the things that Catherine Berlodgett said, I found this little quote of hers that I really loved. And she said, I pulled this out of a newspaper article, scientific research is like a Christmas gift. And then here's what she said about it. Sometimes what you get is what you least expect. Which ties into this discussion that we have here every single day. You know, so many times the actions that happen in your life don't lead where you think they're leading. They lead you in a totally different direction. And who knows if she would have ever even considered going into what she did or even ended up back at General Electric had these connections not happened the way they did. But then, but they did. 
and and then getting back to her quote sometimes what you get is is what you least expect the thing that that strikes me that i love so much about this is the generational connection there's this there's this scripture uh, in the old testament it's in the book of malachi and i'm not going to get into the doctrinal discussion the so many people have talked about what these verses mean and why they're there, but there's this, there's this verse in it's Malachi chapter, uh, chapter four. And it's specifically in verse six where it says it in verse five, it talks about Elijah coming, but in verse six, it says something really cool. It says, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. And you can do whatever you want to with the doctrine. But the point that I love about this is this intergenerational connection turning the heart of children back to the fathers and hearts of the fathers to the children as if you're tying these groups together. And, and for me, what I love about this is, is the looking back to where you came from. There's a certain power and beauty to that idea of, of looking at your ancestors. And it's a really, it's kind of fascinating when you think about this because you have two parents because you have two parents, you have four great you four four grandparents, and because you have four grandparents, you have eight great grandparents, and because you have those eight, you have sixteen great great grandparents. And if when you do the math, if you go back eight, so you go back ten generations, which is your eighth great grandparents, there are one thousand and twenty four of them, of your eight great grandparents there were a thousand and twenty four of them in your history and if you add all these people together your grandparents your great grandparents great great grandparents and and you put all those you add all those numbers together going all the way back to that 10 generations there are two there were two thousand and forty six people just in those 10 generations two thousand and forty six people that got you here two thousand and forty six people that resulted in you <clears throat> and I, excuse me i love that whole idea that you are the cumulative result of these two and it's more than that obviously you go back more generations and it gets into the hundreds of thousands but you are the cumulative result but basically starting back probably in the 1700s with these with these 10 generations of 2046 people and understanding and recognizing and appreciating and respecting that connection i think is such a wonderful thing and there's so much potential there because when you look at a story like I just told, there's this full circle where she has a father that works, his, his job, his career is protecting patents. And he has a daughter who works at the same company who creates the things that need to be patented. I think she ended up with six patents or something like that during the course of her career, which is pretty awesome because I have zero. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't have any, but she's she was able to create some amazing things. But this full circle of her father was a patent attorney, and then his daughter creates the things in the same company that need patent protection. And when you start thinking about who you are and what your mission and your role in life is, sometimes it's not as you don't have to look that far. It's look back a generation, look back a couple of generations, go back to the great grandparents and the great great grandparents if you can and see what they did, who they were, what they loved, what they were passionate about, what the things were that moved them. Because there's a really good chance that somewhere in there you can find you. By taking just a couple of steps back, identifying a little bit more about who you are and who you can be. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. 
We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. Mm